defense plays a large role in the U.S. biodefense enterprise, contributing biodetection tools, medical countermeasures and protection, and decontamination technologies. The recent response to the Ebola outbreak illustrates the importance of the Department of Defense's biodefense contributions to broader government and global efforts. This hearing is especially timely in preparing for our subcommittee hearing next week with the Department of Defense on countering weapons of mass destruction policy and programs for the fiscal year 2017. The findings and recommendations discussed today will be important aspects of our review of the fiscal year 2017 Department of Defense Biodefense Enterprise. Our witnesses before us today are the Honorable Ken Weinstein. He is the Blue Ribbon Panel Study Panel on Biodefense Panel member. Additionally, uh, Dr. Gerald Parker, the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense Panel ex officio member. I'd like now to turn, but he's not here, Mr. Um, Jim Langevin, but um, Lindsay has assured us that he'll be here soon, and, um, and we will proceed. And so we'd like to begin right this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Wilson. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today on behalf of the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense and to represent our co-chairs, Governor Tom Ridge and Senator Joe Lieberman, as well as the rest of our colleagues uh, who worked with us on the study panel. As you mentioned, last October we released our bipartisan report in which we provided an assessment of our national biodefense and offered 33 recommendations that we believe will improve our ability to defend against biological threats of all types. Uh, against those that are intentionally and maliciously introduced, against those that are naturally occurring, and also against those that result from accidental release. Before highlighting a couple of these recommendations, I'd like to briefly discuss the biological threat that we currently face. I'll start with the anthrax attacks of 2001. We don't need to remind you up here on Capitol Hill about those attacks and about how they were a tragic wake-up call to the nation about the possible consequences of deadly biological agents falling into the wrong hands. As tragic as those, those attacks were, however, there's good reason to believe that future attacks could be much more devastating. For one, we know that there are stockpiles of biological weapons throughout the world that may now be or may become accessible to our enemies. When the U.S. discontinued its offensive biological weapons program in 1969, other nations, including the former Soviet Union, continued to produce stockpiles of biological agents, stockpiles that represent an appealing opportunity for rogue nations and those terrorist groups like ISIS that are intent on inflicting the maximum possible damage against our nation and against our people. And as we on the panel heard from a number of experts who appeared before us, including former Senator Jim Talent, former Representative Mike Rogers and others, our enemies are currently taking specific steps to develop or to procure biological weapons for use against us. Intelligence indicates that they're actively trying to recruit scientific experts they're seeking control of laboratory, manufacturing, and other infrastructure for biological weapon production and development. They're talking about how best to deploy biological weapons, and they're making concrete plans for the use of these weapons. In light of this information, we believe that it's not a matter of if, but rather when and how soon a biological attack will be launched against our nation, our people, or our allies. And the fundamental question is whether we're equipped and prepared to handle this imminent threat, and sadly, our panel found that the answer to that question is no. Despite a number of important strides taken in the past 14 years since the anthrax attacks, we failed to develop the coordinated and comprehensive biodefense that's necessary to meet and defeat this threat. To address this failing, our panel made 33 recommendations that we believe will improve our nation's overall ability to prevent, deter, detect, respond to, recover from, and mitigate biological threats. And if I may, I'd like to highlight just a couple of those recommendations. First, recognizing that leadership is the key to success for any such effort, our initial recommendation is that the White House take point in coordinating the national biodefense, and specifically that the Vice President take charge of that effort, that he establish and operate through a biodefense coordination council comprised of representatives of the responsible agencies, and that as a first step, he and the coordination council jointly develop a national biodefense strategy to, re to replace the current piecemeal strategies, directives, and policies with a comprehensive strategy that contains 
both the overarching vision and the specific policy and operational objectives that are necessary to drive the construction of a viable national biodefense. In conjunction with this and the other recommendations that are directed primarily to the executive branch and its state, local, tribal, and corporate partners, we also recommend that Congress take steps to contribute to this effort. Specifically, we recommend that Congress follow the lead of this committee and enhance the level and the intensity of its oversight in the biodefense area. Progress in this biodefense area will require strong encouragement and strong oversight from Congress. And while we applaud this committee for taking the step of having this hearing, we recognize that it is only a first step, a first step of what will be a long-term national effort to build an effective and enduring defense system to protect against the biological threat. It's important to remember that after the terrorist attacks of 9-11-2001, we succeeded in doing exactly that, and we built a defense system that has largely protected us against the more general, traditional terrorist threat. With commitment and with support from both the executive and the legislative branches, I'm confident that we can do that again, and we can build a defense system that will protect us against the specific threat of biological attack and infection. I want to thank you, sir, for holding this very important hearing and for having me here today, and I look forward to any questions you may have. And Mr. Weinstein, thank you very much. And uh, it, it's ironic that you would uh, reference anthrax. I was elected in a special election right at that time, December 2001. What an introduction to Washington. Uh, Dr. Parker. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Langevin, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. It is an honor to be here with Honorable Ken Weinstein representing the Biodefense Blue Ribbon Panel. Mr. Weinstein covered the threat and the need for a biodefense strategy. For my part, I would like to bring a few programmatic issues to your attention. As a retired member of the Armed Forces, I spent many years working to protect the nation, our soldiers, and their families. I am proud to tell you that the Department of Defense institutions, such as USAMRID, which I once commanded, contribute significantly to U.S. biodefense alone and in concert with our civilian and international partners. These organizations are, have dedicated scientists. They conduct cutting-edge research. They discover new countermeasures, and they provide science-based knowledge to operations. In summary, they are the go-to scientists to counter bio-threats for the DOD. While this is commendable, it does not mean that these human institutions are infallible, as has been recently seen in both military and civilian labs in the DOD and HHS. They have made mistakes and have left uncorrected will contribute to the nation's biological risk. The recent laboratory safety and security breaches at Dugway illustrate this point. As you know, despite following protocols, viable anthrax spores were inadvertently sent to other labs over an extended period of time. As it turns out, there is an incomplete scientific understanding of the inactivation process. There are no standardized protocols for inactivation, and the checks that Dugway had in place were insufficient. It is important to note that DOD's risk assessment concluded that this incident posed little risk to public health, but we must assume that without continued focus on smart improvements in biosecurity, biosafety, this will happen again somewhere in the nation's laboratory network with a worse outcome. We cannot afford institutional failures. One of the basic tenets of DOD is that we must protect the warfighter. No other agency can do that for DOD. This is a top priority, and the case of a biodefense means addressing a number of vulnerabilities. Military personnel are the most likely to be exposed to infectious disease threats some which the world has never seen before, and some which do not have any treatments. Ebola is a good example of this, but there are worse examples. This means that we have to protect our soldiers. We need trained and equipped medical teams with logistical support ready to respond to outbreaks or bioterror attack. We have to have rapid diagnostics, effective biodetection, as well as global biosituational awareness. These and other issues drive a number of DOD programs to include the Chemical and Bi Biological Defense Program, the Military Infectious Disease Program, the Cooperative Bioengagement Program, GEIS, DARPA, and others that broadly follow either ATNL 
our health affairs and OSD. I want to emphasize there, there are many hardworking, de dedicated professionals working in these programs, but we need to better prepare for the eventual use of biological weapons. We believe that DOD, need, DOD needs to clarify parameters for military support to civilian authorities in response to a domestic biological attack. Update and implement military biodefense doctrine, hopefully tiered to a new national strategy as recommended by the panel. Let me provide one programmatic example of the need to improve military-civilian collaboration. There is a long-standing need for effective biodetectors on and off the battlefield. Mr. Langevin and others that serve on the House Committee on Homeland Security are well aware of the DHS experience with BioWatch, a biodetection system that a number of experts, experts believe is insufficient to the needs of the nation. DOD also has a separate biodetection program and has had one for years. And although DOD and DHS are communicating better than ever on these programs, this is just an example where we need integrated, an integrated program, in this case, biodetection, driven by strong centralized leadership, guided, guided by a national biodefense strategy that we can feel effective and affordable solutions in a timely manner for our soldiers and citizens. DOD and the interagency face a number of other challenges. These include the, the need to establish effective BW intelligence, authoritative micro, microbial forensics and attribution, and decontamination and re remediation. I can go into detail about these later, but before closing, I would like to add that the lines between BW and infectious diseases have blurred, and DOD's positive contributions to global health security through our OCONUS laboratories, our global biosurveillance programs, and cooperative bio-engagement cannot be overstated. In closing, I would like to thank the members of the subcommittee again for this opportunity to appear for you today. Thank you. Thank both of you. And uh, we're going to begin now, and uh, Katie Sutton's going to maintain a strict five-minute rule for all persons, including me, uh, on questions. And so right away, um, one of the recommendations, uh, Mr. Weinstein, of the report is to improve the intelligence community efforts to address the biological threat. Can you further elaborate on the specific measures that could be taken to uh, indeed achieve uh, at, at better estimates of biological threats? And then um, specifically, uh, you had indicated that scientists were recruited, that there are facilities that could be used. Uh, a concern that I've had is a, a major city uh, in Iraq, being Mosul, um, that uh, with the capture by ISIL, uh, that there would be hospitals, there would be um, medical facilities, there would be uh, universities uh, that might have um, uh, the facilities that could facilitate uh, uh, the development of weapons to attack the American people. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I think you've put your finger on one of the big risks here. Um, look, the, the bio threat has it's always been one that's cause people in the government to lie awake and worry about it at night, and especially since the anthrax attacks. Um, but I think what is new now is what you just identified, which is the, the primary adversary. I mean, it used to be Al-Qaeda. We were concerned about Al-Qaeda generating weaponized anthrax probably in caves or in pretty primitive facilities. Mm -hmm. We now have ISIS that's infinitely better funded, infinitely better resourced, more people of all types, not just um, not just fighters, but people of um, educational background, scientists and the like, and as you indicated, they have facilities. They have, they have the, the footprint where they can put together an, a program like this and have the continuity and the protection to do that, but they also have hospitals and labs and that kind of thing right there in their territory. So the threat, I think, has always been there, and we've heard about it from a number of different commissions and panels. But this is, I think, um, it's, it's a new threat, a, a newly enhanced threat. In terms of the intelligence and what the intelligence community can do, look, I, I, this was an unclassified exercise. We didn't get classified, I didn't get a classified briefing from um, the intelligence community. But we did learn about sort of the general state of intelligence. And it's clear to us that they, the intelligence community would be doing a much better job if they were linked in with a more centralized, coordinated, all of government effort then their requirements and their intelligence collection can be more focused in order to be to enhance the overall effort to identify the terror the bio threat think of best ways of of 
dealing with it, and then um, uh, and then taking those steps. So I think that it uh, the intelligence community is going to be a major player in this. What we we present as a potential overhaul of the bio defense bureaucracy, um, and it's going to require some direction from the top. Well, thank you again for your uh, efforts bringing this to the attention of the American people, both of you. Uh, in the report, the panel noted that work dealing with cyber threats to pathogen security is nascent and that the United States is not yet well positioned to address cyber threats that affect the biological science and technology session sectors. Could you further describe the cyber threat identified by the panel? What role could the Department of Defense play in responding to this biological security cyber threat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, will ad we'll ad try to address that for you. Um, we're in the age of biology, and biology is all about information from the genetics, the proteomics, uh, and, and so forth, as well as our medical records. Um, and so it is, it is all about information. And much of our information now is, it's all digital. And we're also in the era of synthetic biology, uh, where in the not too distant future, new and dangerous pathogens can actually be synthesized. And so the ability to protect this information, make sure the information does not get misused, is, is actually a very critical step. And I believe there are things you know, being put in place to help protect that information. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think this is an area that's going to require increasing focus as we move forward um, so that this information doesn't get hacked and misused. And has there been uh, proper uh, public-private uh, cooperation, uh, including universities, with the government to address this? I think it's still, I would say, a work in progress to begin to, to address how we make sure and protect. And it's, it's a dual-edged sword. On the one hand, we have to be able to share information to collaborate for solutions. But on the other hand, we have to make sure that we can protect the information so it's not bad, being used for nefarious purposes by bad people. So we do have to be able to work it both ways, but it's a work in progress, and I think more attention will need to be put in place here so that we can have the appropriate security but also be able to share in the scientific discoveries and, and work that needs to take place in, in collaboration and across that, that space that you mentioned. Well, with both of you, we look forward to working with you in the future. I now shift uh, to Congressman Pete Aguilar of California. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate uh, the report uh, and, the, and the work that you're doing. Dr. Parker, you, you touched on this a little bit and the, and the chairman mentioned it. Um, you know, the coordination between, you know, DHS and, and, and DOD, can you talk a little bit about that and the role within the biomedical advanced research, you know, groups and, and DOD as well? Um, what more we can do to foster that? The, the chairman mentioned uh, obviously the, the potential to have uh, events abroad um, and here nationally as well. I represent the city of San Bernardino uh, where the incident was uh, last month and um, obviously if it, it could have gone a different way. Um, and so uh, making sure that, that the coordination between you know, local law enforcement agencies you know, also exists within a, a DHS interface or, or DOD interface is something that, that I think our communities also want to see us uh, take serious. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for the question, and, and, and absolutely. Um, and, and I think you know I, I spent uh, a lot of my career in, in government and was a major proponent, cheerleader, whatever word, for interagency coordination. And there are a lot of people working very hard at trying to drive interagency you know, collaboration and communication. And, and they're, I would say they're doing a good job. But on the other hand, we can do better. And it really comes back to the central tenet of the findings of the report that the need for having strong, centralized leadership driven by a solid strategy and then tied to the budget and department agency accountability with clear leads and supporting roles identified, timelines, metrics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It really comes down to that leadership and strategy it's going to be necessary to improve our, our collaborative interactions across the departments and agencies. People are working. They're trying to work very, very closely together. But sometimes process can be more important than the outcome. And the only way to get above that, again, strong leadership, strategy, accountability, tied to the budget, and, a, and somebody willing to make some hard decisions. But I, want, I do not want to give you the impression that people aren't working hard to collaborate and communicate, because they are. 
No, 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 ab absolutely, and and uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't indicate that. But but areas, you know, specific ways that that we can. Um, you know, use the committee and use the work that we're doing to, to highlight those, you know, positive examples as well as, you know, areas of deficiency where we can continue to improve, I think is important. And, and, and I think this is also very, you know, also critical too because in the report, we're not, we're not recommending increases in the budget, but it really comes down to how can we best use the budget available. Sure. Um, and then, you know, it comes down again to that leadership accountability and the strategy to enhance that collaboration across the interagency space. Mr. Weinstein, anything to add? No, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. We now proceed to Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Parker, for your testimony. Mr. Weinstein, good to see you again. You and I served in the in the White House together, so I'm excited to, Great to see you. be able to connect with you. Um, I wanted to talk about the report's comments on the rapid development and employment of developmental Ebola vaccines, which was quoted, you know, quote, a remarkable achievement. But the report also noted that the general medical countermeasurement development is very risk averse and is not focused on innovation. Can you talk about what some of the lessons learned uh, from the development of the Ebola vaccination and how we can improve uh, how our MCM development improves, uh, how we can improve that? Yeah, if, well, first, um, like the report says, um, medical countermeasures development acquisition procurement, it's really hard. It's ri it, there's risk for everybody involved. It's hard for the government. It's hard for industry. I will say, as, as it was, uh, ECHO has, as it was reported, it was an amazing achievement how the federal government industry surged to try to produce an Ebola vaccine very quickly, but we still don't have an Ebola vaccine. What's really critical is what we do between outbreaks, mm -hmm. between attacks, if we don't have something available in the stockpile or soon to be licensed, it's going to be very hard to have it and surge. I think that's really one of the big lessons uh, with the Ebola outbreak. What is critical is between epidemics, not in a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And it comes back then to leadership, strategy, and accountability. It, then down at the lower level on, you know, what can what can we do to improve our medical countermeasure development? We've got to be willing to take risk in that in between out, uh, outbreaks. We've got to bring more um, innovation to that. Tried and true past technologies aren't going to necessarily work. And we have to also think about the regulatory pathways. How can we improve that? And the FDA is thinking about those things. So are increased public-private partnerships uh, a way we can improve that? How can we better uh, employ public-private partnerships? Well, I think they are key because there's no way that government alone can do this. There's no way industry can do this. This is a space that, just like tropical neglected diseases, biodefense, uh, there is no commercial market or very little commercial market. So that public-private partnership is going to be key. Some of the things I would say actually the DOD does pretty well is has a little bit more transparency in what their requirements are and what the long, you know, five-year um, planning budget cycle looks like. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more transparency in what the needs are, what the requirements is kind of critical. Um, reducing some of the bureaucratic decision-making delays is very critical, particularly for industry. We heard the, the panel heard that a lot from from um, from industry during during our our, our look at this. Um, and so we, in, in some of the, some of the uh, federal, even in DOD, um, the federal acquisition contracting is not industry, it's not best business practices for the small companies. We're not talking about large pharmaceutical companies that are part of the biodefense space. It's primarily small biotechno biotechnology companies that are having a difficult time surviving. And many of the federal acquisition contracting is 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 not conducive to, their, to that industry best practices. Now, I would um, um, applaud DOD recently, particularly the Joint Program Executive Office, um, has announced you know, an intention to use um, more more use of other transactional authorities. That's a move in the right step, right uh, right direction. Mr. Weinstein, do you have anything to add? No, thanks. He covered it. Great. Um, well, I have one minute left. Um, are there 
Can you elaborate on possible incentives that could be used to improve public-private partnerships? So we understand this is a way to bring innovation to the table, but what specific incentives um, should we put into place? Well, there's, there's um, a, a number, number of, I think, incentives that were uh, the panel heard uh, during um, our, our study. Um, and since I'm not from industry, um, I'm academia now, um, I may not be the best to actually get down in the details of specific incentives that would be good for industry. But I think the point is, what we recommend in this is that we really need to have industry and government come together and really talk about what works. And industry will no doubt come up with a pretty good list. And there's no doubt that some of those may not work for government. But on the other hand, government's going to have to be a little bit more open than they have in the past and actually not just listen, but do something about it. So I think the real key thing, and we, I think we capture pretty well in this report, is the need to really identify those with the public and private partners, talk about what's practical and can be done, and begin to implement. I don't, and there's been, there's been discussion about it before, but nothing's been implemented, or very little. Thank you, my time's expired. Thank you, Con Congresswoman. We now proceed to Congressman Brad Ashford of Nebraska. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, and thanks for the report. Uh, you know, we uh, at the University of Nebraska have engaged in, and I know you're aware of this, uh, a number of initiatives, starting with Dr. Phil Smith uh, a few years, well, 10 or 12 years ago, and some of his initiatives that have evolved into the Ebola uh, facility at UNMC. And, um, and there is a great hope that they can expand that facility further uh, to provide training and other, uh, not, not obviously not only for Ebola, but for the whole, the whole uh, grouping of, of threats here. Um, and again, that is, I thought, uh, Congress, Congresswoman Stefanik's point is well taken, is that facility and that initiative at UNMC is a public-private partnership uh, as well and and uh, uh, so the kind of training that um, would go on there and I know your report reflects this is is not only to, we'd be training healthcare professionals training others that are that are uh, going to be engaging in these threats how would you see that training regimen working and and I know you've mentioned it in the in the report but if you could just elaborate on that well first thank thank you for the contribution by the University of Nebraska uh, outstanding professionals that really um, um, stood up to the task uh, when the nation needed them very badly. So thank you for that. Um, and it really is that training education. We need, really need to go back to the basics. And um, I, I think back actually in the after the anthrax letter attacks that we've already talked about here uh, early on, a lot of the, the programs, particularly the, say, the hospital preparedness, the CDC public health preparedness um, grant programs that really expanded after 911, really focused a whole lot of effort on infection control, the medical, man man medical management of biological casualties, some of the basics that were really needed across this country so that we could do that. I think somewhere in that intervening time, you know, two, 2005, 2006, we begin to lose that edge. Um, and I think that's apparent in the Ebola outbreak. But it seems it's, it's, there seems to be such a uh, your report reflects this, but such a revival in in uh, in this comprehensive approach now. It's not just about reacting, obviously, but it's being very proactive, and and it's a very welcome uh, report. I, I, I hesitate to to mention to to the chairman that uh, that in Nebraska, not everything happens in South Carolina. I don't want to make light of light of that, but I mean we we have certain. <laughs> We love South Carolina, but <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And hey, but, you know, uh, but I would say, we uh, just to follow on, we've only made recommendations. Right. No, I, I understand, but those, and but so had that roadmap. We, these recommendations need to be implemented and right. act upon so that we can correct some of the deficiency to, that I think are apparent in the system and, I, now. and what's interesting about the, the, the effort, I think, not only at UNMC, but certainly Emory and other institutions around the country is the, these institutions do stand ready to uh, make the investment in right. plant and equipment to, you know, move forward. So thank you very much. It was thank a great, you. great thank report. You. Thank you very much, Congressman. And hey, from South Carolina perspective, we really appreciate that in Nebraska, you are hardy people to live where you live. And, 
And we now, hey, talk about hardy people. It's really tough. San Diego, uh, Congressman Duncan Hunter, also California. Al also in the South. Yes, yes. Southern California. I just want to piggyback on, on Ms. Stefanik's question. You, you, you didn't really answer, what are the actual incentives? Besides saying transparency and let's get together and sing kumbaya, what are the actual incentives to keep private companies with stockpiles or to keep them a, ahead of the whole curve it, in the first place? Like what are the what what is DOD doing with with the FDA, for instance, to say, hey, we're going to add you to the uh, what is it, the priority voucher program, like they just like we added e Ebola to last last year? What are we going to do to add anything else that our service members face overseas with the FDA and DOD, so that industry is ahead of it and not playing catch up when bad things happen? Well, I I think actually I go back to perhaps um, what the panel actually concluded that. Maybe the most important incentive um, goes back um, to the original Project BioShield in 2004, uh, that having that appropriation up front so that industry knew that there was going to be a market uh, for the countermeasures that were going to be developed. That's probably the single most valuable in, in incentive. And then DOD says, hey, we're going to focus in these three areas, for instance, and that's that's where the appropriation is going to go towards. We're going to go towards well, that. Well, I guess Project BioShield was more fo that's focused on HHS and and, and DOD. I mean, uh, HHS and and DHS and the relationship of who does the threat determinations, who works on on the countermeasure development against those those threats. Um, DO, DOD doesn't have a similar appropriation like that, but at least DOD has five-year budgeting plans that. Um, Short of a an appropriation up front, that five-year budgeting plan for DoD is 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 pretty solid and does give industry an idea of what's going to come. Of course, those those budgets can change every year. How Again, do you know what to, how do you know what to stockpile or what what you need private industry to do when you don't know what the bad guys may have or what what they may use? Well, you know, all the you know in the old days, in the old days, in the old days, I'd say the Cold War, post Cold War era it was it, era, it was much easier. There was a list of, and the intelligence had a list of potential pathogens, and they've been codified in the CDC list. And so that could be anthrax, smallpox, plague, the hemorrhagic fever viruses, botulinum neurotoxins. Those are traditional BW threats. We still need to be worried about those. There's a reason why we need to have a huge stockpile for of antibiotics against anthrax. Anthrax is special, but actually you asked a very good question because the problem is getting harder. The list, in fact, lists are really no more applicable today, although we still need to pay attention to those six I mentioned, but it's getting harder today in the era of biotechnology, synthetic biology. It could be anything. And so it, it is a challenge. Again, go back to BW intelligence. We need to put more emphasis on that. And in defense of the intelligence community, it's a hard, hard problem. Bio in, in, in the WM space is the hardest of the hard. Let me ask you this. So do you know where we have people at throughout the world? So I'm just ask, is there one, is there anything just screaming at you in the, in the face where you're like, we have people here and we're not pre prepared for this? Yeah, there, there, there are certain areas, I would say, um, on the Korean Peninsula. I'll give you an example that um, we have been, the DOD, in fact, has been working very hard with counterparts in the Korean military and the CDC against some pretty known, um, thought to be high priority threats. And the doctrine is evolving and should be different because we need to be worried about not only force on force, military deployment of biological weapons in a scenario like that, we need to be concerned about covert use against not only the military, but the civilian population. So these are areas where we have not only a large number of military forces, we also have strategic partnerships with our allies that happen to be in very large population centers that are living very close well, to a determined enemy. This just made me think of another question then. If you have you, you talk about Korea, so I'm, I'm guessing China and, and Russia have the, the technological capability to be able to develop different bad, bad things to affect people. Do you have to worry about that in places like, like Syria, where the lab might be in someone's kitchen? I mean, it's not like they're high-tech compared to the, 
the North Koreans or the Russians or Chinese or even the Pakistanis. Well, I, I think, yeah, that, the, the first question really kind of got into that. When these, these areas, the problem is very hard. And these small clandestine labs, it'll be very difficult for our intelligence community to ever uh, But they don't have the technology it. to be able to make more sophisticated bad, bad things either, do they? You, you, you can't make that in a, in a kitchen in, in Syria. It you can, you can, you can make some BW pathogens that can cause significant number of casualties in a relatively small clandestine laboratory and also <clears throat> get it in a, in a condition that be, would be relatively easy to s disseminate. It's a serious threat. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Congressman, and thank you for citing the uh, threat to the uh, concentrated population of Korea, because actually what you're saying is the capital of Seoul it has a population of nearly 20 million people, very compact, uh, very much uh, at risk. Uh, Congressman Pete Aguilar. Just w one more question, gentlemen, since I have, uh, since we have you, and I, and I get one more bite at the apple. And, and uh, Dr. Parker, you talked about leadership, and could you just describe to me the discussion and the decision by the panel to institutionalize and empower the vice president um, as the kind of point of contact and the, and the focal point within the report? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I'll, either, either I'll, one I'll of start. You, uh, uh, sure. Ken probably has some um, observations as, as well. Um, due to his White House experience. But uh, the, the panel actually, um, it became pretty clear early on that leadership was, was, a, was an issue. It was a factor. And the need to somehow instill, inculcate stronger leadership. So the panel actually looked at a very, various options um, to include um, reinstituting um, the special advisor for health security and biodefense. Even ac actually had the the three previous special advisors testified before the committee, looked at that model, looked at the, the so-called czar model, and several other things were, were considered, but it kept coming back to who has got really the ear of the president that also has the ability to make some hard decisions that can affect the budget, and who can really also represent those outside of government the best, speak on their behalf, and also encourage those outside government, particularly state governments, local governments, and lead efforts needed there as well. And it really kind of backed into this, the decision that the position who's best suited to do that is the vice president. Ken, you want to... Good question, and I, I concur with everything Jerry just said. I mean, it's it, at first blush when you hear a panel recommending that the vice president should take on this one sort of discrete area, you think, gosh, that's a little bit of a bold uh, proposal. But for all the reasons Jerry mentioned, I, we, I thought it, it made sense. And I was the Homeland Security Advisor last year, the President Bush's administration, and, you know, obviously that my job was to ensure that there's coordination on major issues and that we get progress and we get consensus and the like. And that's tough to do with small issues, day-to-day um, -day issues. Incredibly difficult to do when you're trying to take the bureaucracy and build something new, something much stronger than what we have now. And so I, my, you know, my frame of reference is what the government did after 9-11. And I think it's a pretty, pretty much of a success story, not absolute success, but the government really um, went through an overhaul after 9-11 to meet the traditional terrorist threat that we saw on 9-11. And it had been pretty successful with it. But that took an enormous effort driven directly by the president and obviously with Congress in lockstep. This is a very serious threat. It's more discreet, it's more focused, but it requires almost as many different actors within the executive branch to work in concert. And our thought was, gosh, we could have one department head sort of anointed as the coordinator, but you know, then you have the same bureaucratic tensions that you'd always have when you know, equals are having to listen to, you know, there's a, one person designated as you know, um, higher than the others. You could just have somebody in the National Security Council like we've had in the past. Bob Cadlick was the person in the Homeland Security Council when I was there, very effective, but probably not enough to really get across the goal line. So we thought, look, the Vice President has taken these kind of tasks on before. Um, 
this vice president has taken on these kind of tasks. And this is one that really warrants it, given the threat. Um, so we thought, look, we'll, we'll put that out there. And I know we've, uh, the chairs have had meetings with the White House about this. And I think people are intrigued. And thank you very much, uh, Congressman. And I'd like to uh, thank both of you for being here th this afternoon. And uh, Congressman Langevin, the ranking member, um, sends his regrets that uh, we're imminent to voting, and he's close to the floor. And uh, But I'm very grateful for the work of um, Ms. Sutton, Ms. Kavanaugh, and we are adjourned.